you know, we're all born with a very innate desire. We all know deep in our, in our spirit, in our soul, that we need love. And sometimes we go about the wrong way getting it. And sometimes we're hurt by our parents. But sometimes it were parents were hurt when they were growing up. But we have that innate desire to feel loved. So we think, well, when I get married, I'll feel loved. But that's not God's love. God's love is entirely different than that of your spouse. Because let's face it, when we get married, we're two different people. But it's a covenant. I was married for 61 years, my wife passed away. I miss her terribly, but I had a covenant with her. And the covenant was based on me and her and God. I retired early, came down to Florida, and my wife started a Bible study. I didn't start a Bible study, she did. And for 16 years, every week in our house, we held a Bible study with 15 to 20 people. That's where I learned the Bible, because my wife said we should start a Bible study. I said, thank you for that wife. <laughs> that led me to the Bible. Because but when you're married, you have a responsibility, both of you, to honor your wife and you honor your husband. But it doesn't work unless it's a trinity. Of, it's, the marriage has to be a trinity of love. God is at the center, and you, and you pray together, and you honor God and each other based on God's love for each one of you. And you don't criticize and complain. I find that's deadly. And when we first got married for the first few years, I, I, she said, well, I, I, got, I have this problem. I would tell her how to fix it. She said, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen to me. <laughs> so God's, God's love means you listen to each other. And you listen and you learn things. But we have this desire that's hard to be, hard to match. A humble heart is necessary to, to receive the fullness of God's love. I went through all these afflictions in the last five years. And God said, I, I said, God, when is it going to be enough when I have enough afflictions to go through? He said, I want to make you more humble. I said, you were, you're, not, you're not humble enough. So humility comes when you surrender. And humility means that you never get angry. It means you're never irritated by something like someone says. You listen, but you don't take it to heart anything that's said against you, because it has no meaning on your life. Humility is surrendering to the love of God. So the love of God changes your heart. And a couple years ago, I cried out to God in my prayer room, my prayer closet. I said, God, I want to love you more. Help me. I want to love you more. A loud voice came. That's not your job. You can't. I said, what do you mean job? I want to. I, why can't I? He said, that's not what you're supposed to do. I said, well, I don't understand, God. What, 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 what can I do? Help me. He said, I want you to rest, meditate. Let my love come and fill you. I want your love. When you pray, I want my love to touch the people you pray for, not your love. It's my love they need, not yours. I said, well, God, that's easier than trying to love you all the time. He said, well, do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, so we have to love one another, and we have to realize that we're a child of God. Repeat after me, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. He loves me. He loves me. He created me with a purpose. He as Jesus is in this world, I am too. Everything that Jesus did when he walked this earth, I can do it too. I can do even greater works than Jesus did because he's going to be with the Father. He said, what have you ask the Father in my name that I will do for you? I will, I will do it. Do you get it? That means you and you and you and you. You, you can have the same. I have nothing special. But I've learned how to surrender to God. Now some of you here are trying to learn how to surrender to God's love. And about three or four months ago, I said, God, I want to be fully surrendered. I want to be fully surrendered. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want my thoughts, 
my words, my actions to be based on your love for me. And I want my love to show the people that I talk to, but I want your love to be the primary force that comes out of my mouth. Your heart of love. He said, okay. He said, so I laid on my bed and I said, I'm not getting out of bed this morning until you tell me what I got to do. I said, I'm staying right here. I'm not moving. I'm not going to get up. I'm not going to have any coffee. I'm not going to have any breakfast. I'm not going to eat anything until you say something to me. So I waited. I cried out again. I cried out for over half an hour. 25, 30 minutes I cried out. Okay, Daniel, I hear you, he says. He said, I know what you want, but you, you, you have to listen to me. Well, here's what you have to do. I said, tell me, what, 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 what do I have to do, God? You have to now let my strength come on you. Let my love fill you completely. And let me carry you the rest of the way to full surrender. It's not on your own you can do it. You've got to ask me to do it, and I will do it for you. That's how you surrender to God's love. Because his love is so complete and so great that I can't describe it. But in Ephesians 3, 14 through 20, it tells us his love is so high, so wide, so deep, and so long. It's immeasurable. That's why it takes a whole universe to contain some of God's love. And his universe is so big, we have no idea. We're like a one grain of sand on the ocean compared to the universe. We are nothing, but still, he loves each one of you. He loves you. Your name is Karen. He loves you like you're the only daughter he had. He can see you as the only daughter you ha he has. And he knows everything about you. He knows, he knows, what, you're, he knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He has a destiny for you. You know what it is? Uh, to bless him. To love him and lift him up. Yeah, but there's a purpose for your life, and he'll show it to you soon. Next week you're going to hear something of God is what I'm hearing. He has a purpose for your life. It has a purpose for your life. It has a purpose for each one of our life, and it's all based on his love for us. Because love, ta love takes action. Everything you want to do, if you want love, you've got to give out love, right? Are you giving out love to anybody? Are you, are you asking God to bless somebody? Is there unforgiveness on your heart? If, you, if God fills you with his love, you have no unforgiveness anymore. There's no unforgiveness in pure, pure love of God. You walk with the knowledge of who you are. You walk with the knowledge that you're blessed. Unforgiveness will block your healing. There's four kinds of unforgiveness. You have to give those who hurt you. The one I run to most, I was a chaplain in a hospital for a year and a half. And the major thing I heard was, when I was said, Holy Spirit, what's in this room I gotta pray about? I said, what's the problem? 75% of the time, they were sick in the hospital because of unforgiveness. 75% of the time. And the biggest thing I ran into, they hadn't forgiven themselves. They were carrying guilt and shame. Now, Jesus already carried the guilt and shame, and he loves you. Why would you carry the guilt and shame? He's already paid the price. Don't carry it anymore. Give it to him. Give all your cares to Jesus, 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares on Jesus because he cares for you, because he loves you with a love that's supreme, that's not ending. The love is not ending. And the love is so great. When you get filled with God's love, if you want to be filled with God's love, we'll pray for that. But Jesus is here now. Yeshua is here. He's in this room. Holy Spirit, come. You are welcome in this church, in this hall. You are welcome here. Come and fill this place with your atmosphere, the atmosphere of love. And so I call now on the, on the fire of God. Let the fire of God's love fill this hall right now. Fill everyone here. You're going to feel the fire of his love touching your heart, setting your heart on fire. Some of you are going to feel electrical tingling going through your body. The love of Jesus Christ is in this room. It's vibrant. It's moving. It's spreading. It's touching everyone here. Feel it and ask for more. He'll give you more when you ask for it. But you've got to ask for it. He said, you have to knock and you have to ask. Remember, the door to God's heart. There's no knob on his side. You've got to open the door. You've got to open the door and let him in. Let him into the sanctuary. Your body is a temple of the Lord. He wants to fill your body with, with love and hope and joy and peace. Are you asking God to do that? Or are you doing it in the world? The world's love will never sustain you. 
the love of your parents will never sustain you. And parents are hurting too. So we're starting a ministry for foster parents and children because we found out that foster children are abused. They're sometimes sold as sex slaves. All kinds of problems. They're, they're abused. So we're starting, and we found out that uh, only one out of ten foster parents love the children. They take them in for the money. So we're start, we have a campground lined up now in July. We're going to have a campground where we're going to bring in foster parents and children. We're going to pray for healing for the foster parents first because they're the ones that have to heal the children. And so we're going to pray for the children. We're going to counsel them. We're going to show them what God's love is really like. We're going to feel God's love. It's going to change, the, it's going to change all the foster children. We're going to, I hope we'll get other, other places to do it. I started the healing center in Norman Beach. I have a healing center in Norman Beach, Florida. And I have a, I have a, a revival campground out of Pearson, 20, 25 miles west. We bring in pastors and ministers and missionaries there. We pray for their healing because they get beat up by their parishioners. They get, they, get, they get people in their parish that speak against them and talk about them. It was a derogatory. Don't ever talk against the, the, the head of your house or the head of your church. Don't ever talk against them because you're defeating the love that he's trying to give you through the Father. You cannot criticize a leader because you, you, will be, you will be dealt silly and severely with later on. Do not criticize or condemn. It's not your job. I did that years ago, 25 years ago. I was criticizing. I said, that's not right. What's my job to judge? If you judge people, you're going to be judged by the same measure you judge them. But the love of God does not judge you. You'll never hear a negative word from God because it's all about love. He wants to encourage you. He wants to bless you. He wants to fill you with his love, but you got to ask for it. Oh, thank you. Let's see about it. Oh. <laughs> but really, he told us the answer, and I'm trying hard to get there. You must have a child's heart. You must trust God completely like a child. I uh, thought, did Jesus trust his parents when he was born in that? in that stable in Bethlehem. And what, did, what was he thinking about? And I asked, I said, Jesus, when did you first know who you were? When did you first know you were God? But everything about him was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, the, his mother was filled with the Holy Spirit. His father was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had beautiful parents. How many of you had parents that they never told you that they loved you, they never hugged you. How many people here had their father pray for them when they were little? How many? My father neither. How many here had their mother pray for them when they were little? Why, 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 do we, why, why do we do that? Some of you are grandparents. Are you praying for your children? Are you asking God to bless them? Are you spreading the love of God? You know about God's love. When are you going to start spreading it? When are you going to start talking about love? There are some people here that are going to be healed tonight. One gentleman is going to get a new liver tonight, so the Holy Spirit is holding. Another person here has got bad legs, so her legs are going to be healed tonight. You know why? Because God heals. Jesus was either going to heal somebody, leaving the place where he healed somebody, or thinking about healing somebody, but he, he healed every place he went. Do you realize that at the, people, at the meeting where they had 5,000 men, and they had all the women and children and families, there was about 20,000 people there, in that setting, after everybody received communion, he sat them all down, the bread is created in that case, and they all were healed. 20,000 people, he healed them all, it says in the Bible. They were all healed. All the demons were cast out. Every one of them, 20,000 people, they were healed in one city. What's well, impossible for God? With his love pouring forth, his love changes everything. His love fills your heart with a desire for more. I want you to have, I want you to say, I want more of God's love. 
Come and fill me tonight. Fill me to overflowing. I humbly surrender to your love and to, and to your life. <clears throat> you are a child of God, and you have the same inheritance that Jesus had. Can you believe that? And do you, do you know what the love of God does? He wants to, Jesus said, I want to share the glory that I want on the cross. I'm going to share my glory with you. The glory I want on the cross with my blood. I want that glory to fall on you. I want the glory of life to shine on you. I want everything that I died for for you to get it. I want you to have peace, love, joy. I want you to have shalom. Who knows what shalom means? No, peace, no, shalom does not mean peace. That's a lesser meaning of shalom. Shalom in the Hebrew language means I came to make you healthy, wealthy, and give you everything you need. That's shalom. Nothing missing. One rabbi described it. Shalom is nothing missing, nothing broken. It's a blessing. When they say shalom, it doesn't mean peace. It means everything that God has for you has already been provided. He's already paid for everything you need in this life. And his love will provide it, but you have to rest. You have to spend time. How much time do you spend alone with God? If you want his love, you've got to spend time alone. You've got to spend time alone thinking about, I'm a child of God. My, my Savior is Jesus Christ. He loves me. He died for my sins. He comes and lives with me, and I let him. Do you want him to come and live with you? Invite him in. Open the door. Open the door to his love. I'll tell you, his love has changed me. I used to get angry easy. I still get angry once in a while, but not very much anymore because I'm saying, what am I doing? I can't get angry. But anger is a natural emotion, isn't it? But we have to deal with, we have, love changes our emotions. When you have God's love within you, it changes who you are, Christ. Um, so you really don't have to work hard on loving God. He wants to love you more than you want to love him. Because you're his child. How would you feel if you had a daughter or a son and they never called you anymore, never talked to you? You would miss that, wouldn't you? Well, how does he, how do you think he feels when I mean, you go a month and you never pray, you never say, you never recognize God is in your life? But God can heal anything. He can heal a cough. <laughs> he can heal anything at all. But you got to believe. Since we were said, I studied him for 25 years. He said, only believe. If you believe, it's yours. He said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, which is a very tiny, tiny seed, you can be healed. So I said, Lord, give me the faith of a watermelon seed. <laughs> I, I, want, I want something big. <laughs> I want something I can share. And you know, uh, I got a, I'm not going to read it, but I, I wrote a two page summary uh, about the essence of God's love. I'm going to give you a couple of highlights, and you can take a copy back there. Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 44, what I say to you, love your enemies. Are you kidding? Bless those who curse you. Do good, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We have to pray for our enemies. And I thought, so I started praying that God would change the people in Washington, D.C. So I pray for them and ask God, bless them people. They don't know what they're doing. They're lost in the evil. Please bless our, our, our leaders at Washington. And Matthew 5, 46 said, as you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Go and love the ones who love you. Each child that you meet, that you see in this grocery store, that you walk by, they're all children of God. They all need love. When I go to the restaurant, I pray, always pray for the waitress, and they all feel the love of God. The waitresses feel the love of God. And, and some of them blush, their faces get red. 
but they all feel the love of God because I, I'm a purveyor of God's love. Because that's our job, is to give God's love to our children, to our grandchildren, to our spouse, and to our, and to our parents. We must honor our mother and father. If you don't honor your mother and father, you're in, you're in deep trouble because it, they did their best when they raised you. Yes, they made mistakes, but you have to forgive them. Now, forgiveness is not complete until you ask God to bless them. From your heart, you've got to say, bless that person by name. And keep on playing to bless them. Then all the hurt, because if you don't bless them, when you don't forgive somebody, you're cursed. You curse them and you curse yourself. So when you ask God to bless them, the curse disappears from both of you. So bless them. Blessing is the answer. And love brings the blessings. It's his love that does everything. He created out of love. And he's got a plan to give you more love if you ask him. But you've got to take time. How much time are you taking in your prayer closet? How much time do you think about God? How much time do you let him into your mind? He can heal your mind and your emotions. He can cast out the spirit of depression. He can, there's nothing, name me one thing Jesus can't heal. There isn't anything. A man came to my healing center and he said, can you heal me? And he gave me this. He had a list of 15 things wrong with him. I looked at the list I said, I looked at him and I said, well, which one is it that Jesus, that Jesus says to heal? Which one of those? Well, he said, he can heal them all. I said, well, yeah, let's get to work. <laughs> because it's God's love that heals. It's God's love that changes us. But this affection and love, sometimes you need inner healing because you were hurt so badly. And some of you maybe have been married two or three times. I counseled a group of six young adults. They all have been married two or three times. So I said to them, this is your third marriage, yeah. And said, what did you do about the soul ties? I said, what's a soul tie? I said, well, when you get married, you become one flesh. If you have intercourse with somebody, you become one flesh, just like a marriage. Until the soul tie is cut by Jesus, you're taking three people into bed with you on your marriage. So you gotta have your soul tie cut. If you need a soul tie cut, we can do that tonight. Oh, Jesus, I don't do anything, but Jesus does it. So, and some of you have a soul wound, a deep trauma in your heart. So you have to ask Jesus to come into the memory of the trauma. So if you, they can do it at the healing center for you. you have a trauma that needs healing, they pray for you. They ask Jesus to come back into the memory. Jesus comes back into the memory and heals the hurt, takes it away. Or how many of you would like to be healed tonight? I need healing. Okay. All right. I asked if anybody had turned up the dimmer switch on the lights in here. Because several of you know, you sat beside me this morning and I had my flashlight out so that I could read the papers because the lights to me were so dim. I replaced all the lights bulbs in the house with LED 100 watts because I couldn't see in my own home. I can see. Oh, yeah. Hey, Dan. It's nice to see you. Okay, I'm Dan. I was delivered this year of alcoholism, alcohol, uh, sexual perversion, let's just say that, um, rage, anger. I have been praying for a wife since literally I was 19, since like 1990. I was a Christian the whole time, but I fell away. But I was, mar I was married to Michelle uh, just before I turned 50. And God knew my heart. I said, Lord, I didn't want to make it to 30, let alone 40. I said, if I make it to 50 single, I can jump off a bridge here, Lord. You know me. So don't do this to me. So he, in his mercy, I got married right before 50. Um, but he delivered me of all the stuff this year I've set free. I haven't felt this free and like on fire for Jesus since... I was like 17 years old. Literally. Hallelujah. Yeah, so praise God. It's, all, it's really all Him. So thank you, Jesus. Well, I know these prayer calls, and you put them in your pillow at night. I'm going to ask every night when you go to sleep that the glory light shines on you from that prayer call, that the love of God and the glory light shines on you. Now, 
I had a friend and they had a son dependent on drugs, drug addict. I said, what can we do for my son? Shine the glory light of Jesus on them every day for 15 minutes. They did. They just shined the light on their son every day. Two weeks later, he quit the drugs. It was off of them. He'd been an addict all his life. Mm -hmm. Two weeks, the light of Jesus gets out the darkness of the drug addiction. Two weeks, I'm putting the glory light and the love of Jesus on his prayer cloth. If you got a husband that needs fixing, take one home and put it in his stomach.